Sunday evening, everybody. My name is Mark Meckler. Of course, I am the host of your Sunday Night Battle Cry. And I've been gone for a couple of weeks. I mean, I haven't actually been gone. I've been right here in the library at home, running my life and hanging out with the family, kids in town, dogs around, big family. And I hope you guys had great family Christmas and Hanukkah and New Year's and all the celebrations, watched the football games, ate too much food, maybe had a few beers, really enjoyed yourselves. I know I did. And that's what the holidays are for, is for to take the chance to chill out and relax, be with family, take stock of the year that just went past, count your blessings, especially count your blessings and be thankful and be happy, be of good cheer, and then look forward to the new year. <clears throat> it's also a time, you know, depending on your faith, when you celebrate, when we celebrated the birth of our Savior. So it's just, I'm, for me, it's really special. We love it. And it's one of the few times a year where Convention of States really kind of chills out. Everybody hibernates a little bit. It gets quiet. And I get a chance to think and read and do a lot of the stuff that I struggle to get done during the rest of the year to really have time to sit around and contemplate, to have time to really dig into some of my studies. I've been reading a lot. I know we haven't talked about this much uh, in the recent past. I should probably go back and do a one of my reading feature now and then. Uh, so I'll just throw that in for you today. I've been reading this year, for the entire year, Dennis Prager's book on Exodus, Rational Bible on Exodus. Year before, in 21, I did his Bible, Rational Bible on Genesis. And so we did Genesis, now Exodus. Uh, and then I was planning by finishing it by the end of the year. I didn't quite make it, so didn't make my goal. I'm about 100 pages, shall I'll finish that up. And then his next one is on Deuteronomy. I'm going to do that in all of 2023. So I decided to do some deep dive study into the Bible, spend some time in the Word, really get my foundation solid. I think the year after that, I'm going to do the Gospels uh, for a whole year. It's just kind of a way I like to study when I'm studying the Bible and studying the Word. So <clears throat> reading that right now, uh, I've been reading a lot of other books. I got a lot of books here. I've got uh, Paulson on the Constitution. What else do I have going here? Uh, I've got a book on George Mason. I just finished one on George Mason. I'm reading a second on George Mason right now. I know this sounds weird, right? Because I'm saying I'm reading a bunch of books. I generally read five to six books all at the same time. I know that's weird. I know most people don't like to read that way. I leave them all over the house and I'll sit down and have lunch and I'll read a couple chapters of a book and I'll get up in the morning and I'll do a little bit of Bible study. And then maybe at night I'm somewhere else in the house sitting on the couch and I'll pick up another book, maybe something by, uh, you know, I, I read recently Speechless by Michael Knowles. Great book. So I'm working multiple books at a time. I'll keep you guys posted as to what the list looks like, if you're interested in any way. All right, our action item for this week, and really important to start the new year this way, is be of good cheer. And when I say be of good cheer, I mean, no matter the circumstances. And I think this is really important, right? Our attitude is such an important thing. There are three things that you can control in life literally three things. First is who you trust. I think for me, at least that starts with God. Uh, then it expands out from there. Hopefully your family, your immediate family, your wife, your kids, parents, uh, and maybe your siblings. And it starts to expand out from there. But you choose and you have complete control over who you trust. Nobody else can decide that for you. Number two is what you do. And nobody can make you do anything. You decide what time you get up in the morning. You decide whether you're going to exercise or not. You decide whether you're going to be engaged in politics or not. You decide whether you're going to make it to the polls. You decide how hard you're going to work on your job. So you decide who you trust and what you do. Nobody can make you do anything, right? Even under threat, you can't be made to do something. Ultimately, the choice is yours. And then finally, last but definitely not least, is you choose your attitude about what happens. This is really important because most of life happens to us, right? For example, if you watch what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now, you don't have a choice about that. That's stuff that's happening. If you watch what happens in the elections, you don't have a choice what's happening in the elections. That's stuff that happens to you. You can vote, and you do vote, and I love that, and I appreciate that. But after that, not in your control. So how bent out of shape do you get? How frustrated do you get? Do you keep a good attitude? Can you watch, even in the darkest of circumstances, and be of good cheer. And I'm saying, yes, you can. And we absolutely should. Being a happy warrior is what Ronald Reagan did best, as well as any politician I've ever seen. And it's one of the reasons he was very successful as a politician. A lot of other reasons, but part of it is he was always a happy warrior, not an angry warrior, not a frustrated warrior, not a sad warrior, not a morose warrior, 
but a happy warrior. So be a happy warrior. So our first story is something you may or may not be happy about. And that story is what's going on in the House of Representatives right now. And what we have is a fight. Call it a food fight, if you will. And I'll be honest with you, I'm really enjoying it. And I'm not enjoying it necessarily because I'm for or against the people who are for or against McCarthy. I'm enjoying it because I actually like a good fight over leadership. I think this is a healthy thing to have a little bit of a fight. I think it might have gone on too long right now to be healthy anymore. And the reason I say that is there's stuff that the House needs to do, mainly these investigations, the subpoenas need to go out. There's only a certain amount of time where you could be really aggressive with your subpoenas. The people who are doing it, who have the subpoenas ready, the people who are writing the letters to the committee chairs, tell me they've got about eight months of white hot activity before things really start to grind to a halt because people start looking towards the next election. So I'd like to see the thing resolved. But to me, it's been amusing to watch. I do like to watch Kevin McCarthy squirm and suffer. <laughs> I admit that. And maybe I'm bizarre, but I do like this. I think he's earned it over the years. I do think he's an establishment creature. I do think he's part of the deep state. My real question is, what's the alternative? Is there anybody else that could actually be elected speaker? And my read on that is no. Now, we could take bets on this. We could take bets on who's going to actually be the speaker. Just remember, when you bet, the House always wins. Anyway, no, I'm not really taking bets. So if the feds are watching this, you don't have to do a sting operation for an illegal gambling house or something. Don't send me any money, no bets, nothing like that. But it is interesting. Does it really matter what happens? I don't think it matters all that much. The House is gonna have very little power. They can do investigations. I think the conservatives have already gotten good places on the committees. I think there are going to be serious investigations. Can they pass any legislation? Nope, because they haven't gotten the Senate and they don't have the White House. <clears throat> Clearly the Senate and the White House are not gonna cooperate with them. So I don't think it matters as much as some people are trying to make it matter. And certainly to most Americans, who aren't watching it day in and day out, who don't pay that much attention to Washington, D.C., probably doesn't matter at all to them. What matters is D.C. gets its house in order. Do you think that's going to happen? I don't. So instead of crying, I'm going to laugh. Be a happy warrior. All right, number two, uh, and I love this story. It actually makes me happy. The B blue state population decline continues. Here's a great headline from the Daily Signal. I love this. It says, Torrent of Taxes sends New Yorkers fleeing on the southbound expressway. I, I mean, and I think this is fantastic. From July of 21 to July of 22, this is the latest data we have, 300,000 people more moved out of New York than moved into New York. I mean, what a shock, right? Are you surprised? This is why. Let me give you some of the stats. They pay the highest total tax burden and the highest share of personal income in New York. They endure the second worst overall business climate. They face the highest individual income tax rate and income tax collections per capita. They pay the second highest state and local corporate income tax. They have the fourth highest property tax, the highest cigarette tax, the ninth highest gasoline tax, sixth highest capital stock tax rate, and they are tied by the, for the third highest estate tax rate. And so what do New Yorkers get for all those taxes? Well, you know, like everything works perfectly. The roads are glass smooth. The airports are the best, most efficient, and cleanest in the world. They've got a bulletproof electric grid there in New York, and they have the best water infrastructure. The best part is they have the best policing and the lowest crime. Now, now none of that stuff is true, and you've been watching politicians long enough to know that you can hear a lie, right? So those are all lies. They have none of that stuff. The place is garbage. It's burning to the ground. It's a dumpster heap of crime and corruption and degrading infrastructure. And that's what New Yorkers get. And so what New Yorkers are doing is they're voting with their feet. They're leaving. And when they leave, and this is really important to note, they take their money with them. They take the jobs with them. When companies leave, they take all these jobs with them. And so those people are gone and they're gone forever. They're not moving back. Trust me, when they get to Florida and Florida's great climate and Florida's freedom and Florida's prosperity, or Texas's prosperity or South Carolina or Tennessee or all the places they're fleeing to, they're never going back. And so if you look at New York, they've made a New Year's resolution, it seems. Their New Year's resolution is to change everything, right? And make it better. No, their New Year's resolution is to do more of the same thing. They've increased the sales tax on their gasoline, 17 cents a gallon. Uh, right now, if you live in New York and you're going to move to uh, to Florida and you're an average income earner, you're going to save $5,500 a year, literally over roughly 500 bucks a month. 
That's incredible. So the the drain is going to continue from New York. That's good for Florida. It's good for Texas. And by the way, <clears throat> most of the people leaving, they understand why they're leaving. They're not taking their bad politics with them. So people worry about that. Is Florida going to become blue? It's become more red. Is Texas going to become blue? Nope. It's become more red. So let it continue. This is the great decoupling. This is the self-sorting that the American people are doing. I think it's a really good thing. All right, in our next story, we go to the universities because universities are always amusing, right? And this is another, you gotta laugh or you're gonna cry kind of a thing because at UW-Madison, University of Wisconsin-Madison, our buddy, Matt Walsh spoke and he went there to talk about and show his movie, What is a Woman? If you haven't seen What is a Woman, you gotta go, go to Daily Wire, become a subscriber. I'm not getting money for this, go there. It's worth it just to watch the movie, What is a Woman, but so much more. I love the guys at Daily Wire. They're all friends. Ben Shapiro, Matt Walsh, Knowles, Clavin, all of these guys, great podcast hosts, great content, and they're making great movies, including What is a Woman is the Best. And so people, the students apparently at UW-Madison, they can't handle it. The snowflakes are melting. In fact, what they're saying is that him appearing actually made them, quote unquote, physically sick, and then they were actually hurt by the Matt Walsh event physically sick and actually hurt. I mean, this is unbelievable. They're filing complaints. Uh, yeah, Young Americans for Liberty, uh, they say that uh, they are the ones who brought him in. They say that this group should be banned from ca campus. They should be sanctioned for bringing him. Apparently there were protests. And the Dean of Students, Christina Olstad, released an official message through Instagram that condem condemned Matt Walsh as harmful. Harmful, yeah, he's harmful because... He talks and says things. Meanwhile, in New York, there is some sanity. New York University professor argues that Gen Z is too fragile, which is causing a national crisis. This isn't at New York University, so maybe there's still some sanity in New York. Maybe that professor hasn't fled to Florida by now. Jonathan Haidt says that they are experiencing, uh, Gen Z is experiencing a profound mental health crisis due to a number of factors. This is from Campus Reform, which is a project at Leadership Institute. He says the crisis is largely due to a confluence of social media, bad parenting, and political ideology that emphasizes victimhood. You think? Uh, Jonathan Haidt is a prominent social psychologist, and he said in a recent Wall Street uh, Journal interview, Gen Z has been set up for failure due to a confluence of social media, bad parenting, political ideology, and emphasizing victimhood. He says they're experiencing a profound mental health crisis. When you look at Americans born after 1995, what you find is they have extraordinarily high rates of anxiety, depression, self-harm, suicide, and fragility. He attributes the combination to, as we said, social media and culture that emphasizes victimhood. We are actually teaching kids that they're all victims and that they should celebrate and focus on their victimhood status. And of course, that's making them incredibly unhealthy. And I got to say, you know, we complain about millennials. Often people make fun of millennials, but what he found is millennial women are doing well, but Gen Z women, because they're so anxious, are going to be less successful than Gen Z men. That's saying a lot because Gen Z men are messed up too. So I don't know what that tells us. We got a sick society. Uh, don't let your kids go to University of Wisconsin-Madison or any of these woke schools. It's not going to be good for them. And a lot of these schools are going woke. And I would say not just schools, not just undergrad schools, not just schools that you would expect to be leftist. Uh, here's a story from Wharton School of Business, which is at University of Pittsburgh. And this is uh, actually an incredibly, it, it's, uh, sorry, University of Pennsylvania. It is an incredibly prestigious school. It's one of the Ivy League's executive training grounds. Like folks who come out of Wharton are going to be in the C-suites of major universities, or sorry, major companies all across the country. The publicly traded companies, they're going to be run by Wharton grads. And now Wharton has a, a new major. It's called Environmental, Social, and Governance Factors for Business. ESG is the short name for that. If you haven't heard of it, it means woke capitalism. And so they're going to be teaching new executives <coughs> how to properly do woke capitalism, which is super dangerous. I and mean, that is definitely what you would call a wolf in sheep's clothing. You can get your MBA now. You can emphasize DEI, which is diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is another word for, hey, let's teach everybody to be racist, especially against white people and Asian people. And if we do that, everything will be a lot better. They're screwing up capitalism. They're going to screw up 
the golden goose, the go or the goose that lays the golden egg, and this is going on at Wharton. So again, this is a warning. Don't let your kids go to these schools. If you're a parent and you're sending your kid off to college and you're going to pay for it, then you need to have a limitation on what you're willing to pay for. Don't just pay for anything, no matter what, any school, no matter what. When my daughter went off to college. She went to Hillsdale College uh, and she got a great education, a real education. There are universities. If your kid wants to go to college, where you can still get a great education. If you're going to send them to one of these places. You better make sure they're damn strong, indoctrinated against this very difficult uh, woke ideology. So when Wharton's falling, everybody's falling. Uh, speaking of falling, well, maybe not falling because this guy didn't have that far to fall. A uh, former United States member of the House of Representatives, Adams Kinzinger. Adam Kinzinger uh, just got a new gig at, yes, drum roll. Where, where would you expect somebody with Trump derangement syndrome to go? CNN. That's right. He got a new gig at CNN. This is where all people with Trump derangement syndrome go to get on the air. Liz Cheney's been on the air a lot at CNN. We'll see if she ends up getting a gig there or she's just doing it for the fun of it. Uh, but I mean, I'm just not surprised if you're willing to attack Republicans viciously and barbarically, well, you're going to end up on CNN. And for those of us who had hoped that maybe CNN was going to change its stripes, uh, we've seen a, there is a new Chris Licht is the new CEO over there, the guy in charge, and he has let go a bunch of the most left leaning people in the network. But this is a hire that shows that they're still intending primarily to target conservatives. And in the same line of new jobs, David French has landed a job at the New York Times. David French, uh, he of conservative fame, who now spends all of his time criticizing conservatives, pretty much. Another guy, I think, that fell to Trump derangement syndrome. And full disclosure here, I've been friends with the French family for a long time. It just seems to me at this point uh, that David French has gone off the rails. And when you get a job at the New York Times, it proves that you've gone off the rails. So this is what happens with people with Trump derangements. They end up going to enemy publications, people who, uh, publications filled with people who hate America and they're aiding and abetting those people. I think it's terrible stuff. Like I'm, I'm not saying anybody should do anything to them. I believe they should have a voice. I believe they should be able to speak their silliness into whatever forum they want. And these are the forums that will apparently have them. Speaking of a new gig, President Biden apparently doesn't think that Kamala Harris is doing enough as borders are. Is is she doing anything as borders are? Because I haven't seen her do anything. She hasn't visited the border as borders are. Anyway, he's going to the border. It's been announced President Biden will visit the border. And the real question is, will they let him see what's really happening? Will they send him to the border to some squeaky clean place where everything's going perfectly swimmingly? Are they going to actually show him what's going on? and the drug cartels, and the trafficking, and the sex trafficking, and the drug trafficking, and the violence, and the death, and the destruction being wrought upon our border communities? Are they going to show them some squeaky clean, picture-perfect scene? I'm taking bets. Again, This will, we'll take bets on this one. I'm I'm betting on the squeaky clean scene. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm betting on. Remember, the house always wins, and we're not really taking bets, but my bet is they're going to take them to a squeaky clean scene because what they're trying to cover up for the American people, that there's actually a disaster going on our border. There is actually, and I'm using this language very carefully, an invasion taking place at our southern border. Somebody lives in the great state of Texas. We know what's going on. At least 5 million people have illegally crossed that border since Biden was president. Uh, we're going to be making probably an announcement soon. Going to be doing, I think, an event at the state capitol. We're going to bring in people from all over the country. Maybe you can come and be there and tell the president, tell Governor Abbott, tell the state legislature they need to seal that border. Uh, more details coming on that soon. Next, and always, and importantly, what is happening in COS land? Well, the legislatures are back in session all over the country. There's been some craziness already in a couple of legislatures in Ohio. Uh, we thought Derek Marin, Representative Derek Marin, was going to be speaker. There was a bit of a coup that took place. Looks like uh, much more squishy Republicans took control. We don't yet know what that means for Convention of States, uh, but that was really an interesting turn of play. And you saw this happen in, in Ohio. You see it happen in uh, D.C. right now, where you, you don't actually know how these leadership fights are going to come out until they come out. We just saw it happen in Pennsylvania. Some Republicans made a deal with some Democrats for a power-sharing arrangement. Really kind of a bizarre thing that happened there. Again, we don't know how they're going to ultimately work out, 
but there's weird stuff going on in state capitals all over the country. Here in my own state of Texas, unbelievably, we have a majority uh, in the House and Senate. That's not the unbelievable part. The unbelievable part is that we get a speaker because Democrats agree to vote for the speaker, and then the speaker gives him committee chairmanships in a Republican state. Democrats who stop Republican priorities from happening. If that doesn't make any sense to you, it's because it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense to any of us, but we're paying attention to that. Here's the big news in Convention of States land. Uh, we have Rick Santorum, as you know, joined us last year as a senior advisor, and that's been huge for us. Rick's a dear friend. He's an incredible patriot. He's a great conservative. He's been very helpful to the cause, traveling all over the country, testifying in state legislatures, doing grass meeting, grassroots meetings all over the country. Really great stuff having Rick on board. Most of you, maybe not all, but most of you probably know, my co-founder of the Convention of States Project is one Mike Ferris, the one and only Mike Ferris, I think a great American hero. He left about five, six years ago to go run Alliance Defending Freedom, felt a call on his heart by God to go run the largest relig religious liberties organization in the world. Did a great job, 13 cases to the Supreme Court, won 12 of them, decided it was time to turn the reins over to somebody else and retire. Called me up and said, is there still a home for me at Convention of States? And the answer is, heck yeah, absolutely there's a home for you here. So I'm super excited to announce the return of Mike Ferris to Convention of States. I was on the phone with him this morning with Rick Santorum and Rita Peters for our first legislative update call of this year's session. It was so great to have him back in the house. You'll be seeing him on here, maybe on the battle cry. You'll be seeing him on COS Live, and you'll be seeing him coming to a state near you sometime soon. In fact, Mike Ferris and I are going to be in North Carolina at a town hall, I believe in Charlotte, and that is on the 19th of this month. So if you're anywhere near Charlotte, go to conventionofstates.com. You can look up the information, get connected with the state team, find out where that town hall is, and you can see me and Mike personally. So a lot of stuff going on, a lot of movement in a lot of legislatures. I imagine over the next couple of weeks, we'll have a lot more specifics about what's going on in each individual legislature. So we're going to go to Q&A right now. Always my favorite part. Uh, just a couple of questions this time. You guys were slow. Maybe you were resting over the holidays. Christine Johnson says, what is your accomplishment thus far? Well, Christine... I don't want to boast because it's not about me. It's about the grassroots. But we now have assembled the largest self-governing citizen grassroots army in American history. And they are incredible. They are second to none. They do get out the vote. They do election integrity and ballot integrity. In addition to passing the Convention of States resolution in 19 states, having it introduced in 49 states. And let me give you a few stats here. I'm going to grab a piece of paper off my desk. You guys are going to love this because elected around the country convention of states folks former state director jay taylor was elected in west virginia in the state senate seven at 76 percent he is now the senator from district 14. alan chesser who's a former district captain <coughs> he defeated a democrat incumbent he was now elected to a seat in the north carolina state house former cos iowa strategist bill gustoff won a seat in the iowa house former wyoming district captain ev brennan won a seat in the wyoming state senate Former Kansas District Captain Adam Turk is now seated in the House of Representatives in Kansas. Uh, a couple more were still, I think we've gotten results on. I don't have them, but I think there's two or three more who got elected to the state legislatures. It's incredible what's going on. So we've accomplished a lot. And if you join us, I promise you, we're going to accomplish a lot more, Christine. Tina Shimmick asks, can you all go on the Joe Rogan podcast or the Ruben Report to get the message out to more people? How about... Epic Times. Epic Times, we've done a lot of advertising on and in the Epic Times on their digital platforms, but also in the newspaper. So we've been doing that. We will continue to look at doing that. I appear pretty regularly on their television network, uh, doing a variety of commentary on a variety of different issues. So we'll continue to develop our relationship with Epic Times. One of the things coming up, we don't have a date yet, but I went down over the holidays and I filmed with Tucker Carlson his special for Tucker Carlson today. That's the one I'm behind the paywall. <coughs> Excuse me. So that'll be an hour long show. It's as much COS as you could possibly handle. Tucker loved it. Tucker said he fully and heartily endorses COS. So that's going to be a big one. We'll continue to do more and more media. And by the way, if you know Joe Rogan, get me on there, man. Write to Joe. Tell him he needs to have COS there. We've been trying. We'll continue to try. That's sort of the holy grail of podcasting. We're working on... More stuff with uh, Daily Wire, more stuff with Mark Levin, as always. So I think you're going to see a lot of COS 
as you go into the future. So that ties into our overall message and your action item, which is be of good cheer. No matter what happens in this speaker race, no matter what happens in the House, no matter what happens in the Senate, no matter what happens in your local elections, be of good cheer. Go out there, fight the happy fight, be a happy warrior. Go to conventionofstates.com, click on the uh, first sign the petition, then click on the take action tab, sign up, be a volunteer. You can make the difference. Thank you guys. Love you. Appreciate you. And we will see you next week for sure. I'll be here. Hopefully you'll be here on the battle cry.